All right, it is 6.03 and I would like to welcome all of you to How to Transform Traumatic Events into Published Writing with Louise Nair and Lee Steger. My name is Taryn Edwards and I am one of the librarians here at the Mechanics Institute of San Francisco. And I'd like to thank those of you who elected to support this event and pay a little something to attend. Let's just say it goes a long way to help us do more in these challenging times, help us provide more free events to the public, uh, and help us continue the work that the Mechanics Institute has done in San Francisco since 1854. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the Mechanics Institute, we are an independent membership organization that houses a wonderful library. You can see it right behind me. It is the oldest library designed to serve the general public in California, not just mechanics. But I might add that the term mechanic really refers to anyone who works with their hands. So if you're a writer, you are indeed a mechanic. Um, the Institute also is a cultural event center and houses a world-renowned chess club that is the oldest in the United States. So um, right now, due to the lasting effects of the pandemic, um, many of our events continue to be virtual, but we are slowly working our way towards uh, offering in-person events again. Um, and so if any of that sounds exciting to you, I encourage you to come and visit the Institute. We're open Monday through Saturday and membership is only $120 a year. And with that, you help uh, support our continued contribution to the literary and cultural um, world of the San Francisco Bay Area. Now, I am delighted to introduce our speakers tonight. Um, we have Dr. Lee Steger, who is a um, clinical psychologist, an author, and a childhood burn survivor. She earned her doctorate in clinical psychology from Widener University, and she has written for and appeared uh, on numerous media outlets and also is a national keynote speaker. She currently is in solo practice in New Jersey, and tonight she will um, be talking about her writing and also referring to her multiple award-winning book, Flashback Girl, Lessons on Resilience from a Burn Survivor. And then we also have Louise Nair, who has spoken for us before. Um, she is the award-winning author of five books, uh, including her memoir, Burned, which was an Oprah great read and winner of the Wisconsin Library Association Award. Um, she's taught creative writing classes for over 40 years and has been interviewed widely, including uh, on NPR and by me at the Mechanics Institute. Um, she is a member of the Writer's Grotto here in San Francisco and teaches memoir through Ollie of uh, Osher Lifelong Learning Institute uh, via UC Berkeley. All right, a little bit of technical stuff. Before we get started, I just um, want you to, I wanna encourage you to use the chat space, which many of you are doing already. And if you have any questions, let's pose them there and we will get to them at the end of the reading. And as I said earlier, I will send all of you registered guests a link to the YouTube video in a couple of days. All right, we're gonna hear from Lise first. Are we ready? Absolutely. Hello, can you hear me okay? You sound great. Okay, hello. It's nice to connect with all of you this evening. I am a psychologist and an author. I'm going to start with telling you a little bit about the my story and then go into talking about some psychological issues in memoir writing. So bear with me while I share my screen. All right. Okay. 
Okay, very good. I am only gonna show you a couple slides from this. My story begins on a house that looks very like this. Um, can you see, it, can you nod if you can see the house and everything, are we good? All right, thank you. Um, my story begins in 1967 when my family went to take a very brief trip to uh, New Hampshire. And this is the beautiful Lake Winnipesaukee. We were not in this house, but we were in a similar house and it was dinner time. My mother decided to start to cook dinner. So she rummaged around the house for something that she thought was lighter fluid. And she went to pour the lighter fluid on the charcoals. I was standing right next to her, I'm four years old. She pours the lighter fluid on the charcoals, but they don't light. So they take the can again, she pours it on the charcoal. And this can, it turns out, was carrying actually a highly flammable household solvent. So she poured it on the coals. And at that point, there was a giant burst of flame that immediately covered my mother and myself. My mother, in that moment, realized that the only way to save herself was to dash through the wall of flame and right down into the lake. And that's what she did. But she left me in the fire. So I was trapped, alone, and abandoned behind this giant wall of flame. Thank goodness my father was able to see me, and he uh, dashed around the side of the porch where he was and was just tall enough to reach me, and I was just small enough to be pulled through that fence. He got me out, threw me in the lake, and I was saved. It turns out that the very small town of Wolfboro, New Hampshire had absolutely no ability to take care of my mother and myself. And they took one look at us and they said, there's nothing we can do for these two people. But we were very near Boston and Boston, Massachusetts had actually the very best Burns Hospital in the country. So that's where we were transferred and I was saved. This is a picture, and I should have warned you, I'm sorry. You can look away if you wish to. This is a picture of how I looked after this fire. This, you know, 90 seconds of horror left me burned on 65% of my very little body, third degree, which is the most severe kind of burns. Um, you can sort of see in this picture that I lost my lip, um, my chin was burned away, my neck was burned away, my arms were fused to the sides of my body, and I lost my face to the degree that I couldn't speak, actually, other than using my tongue as my bottom lip, nor could I smile or do really anything that one has to do with one's face. And this is how I started out. I've had I, as a child, I had something like 40 or 50 operations. I really don't know how many because my family didn't count because my family was pretty neglectful. And then as an adult, I've had about 25 or 30 more operations. So what you see now is the product of tremendous amounts of time and pain because burns are very painful and mess, because burns are very messy and time away from school and from work and bullying and all kinds of difficulties that I've had in my life. Difficulties dating, you can only imagine. This is how I looked in first grade. This is my first grade school picture. When I'm doing a reading just about my book, Flashback Girl, this is the part in which I start to do a, a rather long reading about um, being bullied as a child and what that was like. I'm not going to do that with you guys today, but this is how I started off in my life. Um, you can see, I think by the look on my face, that I was friendly and eager to connect with people and also 
very, very, very badly disfigured. And that was tough. It's tough now, it was really tough in 1967, back before there were any interventions for bullying. And bullying wasn't even really something, honestly, anybody acknowledged happening. So, <laughs> um, okay. A little bit more setting of the stage. This is my family. I, I want to show them to you because they are major casts of characters in my book. This, the cast of characters in my book is me, my mother, my father, my brother, some other people too, but this is the main cast of characters in what I wrote about. This is the first known picture that I know of anyway that was taken after the fire of the four of us together. And this picture tells you everything you would want to know about my family in one quick snapshot as great pictures do. You can see me there. I'm the one smiling without a face, but look at me trying so hard to be cheerful, trying to do the right thing, you know? You can see nobody has their arms around me. I'm sitting between my parents, but neither one of them is comforting me in any way. There's no protection. It's every man for themselves in this family. My father there, if you had known him, you would find this picture shocking because my father was an ebullient, happy, cheerful, lively go-getter of a man. And in this picture, he looks completely stunned, just shocked from what we had all been through. My mother there, you can see, she looks like she hasn't a care in the world. She's completely emotionally separate from the traumatized child sitting next to her. She's fine. And my brother on the other end is looking intense and troubled. The last picture I'm going to show you from my slideshow, this is my brother. This is the last picture of him taken before he died. My brother died when he was 19. He died quite young. Okay, I'm gonna stop screen sharing. There we go. So that's the setup. That's what I wanted to tell you, kind of the, the teaser of my story, what I wrote about, how traumatic it was. And honestly, I have to tell you, I really haven't even covered half of the rather intense amounts of trauma that are in my book, Flashback Girl. And I'm going to assume because you're here that most of you are also interested in writing about what you have been through. And I'm here to address those issues, not only as a writer, which I am, but also as a psychologist, which I also am. One thing I would say and hear me loud and clear on this. I really think it's important to be quite well before you set out to write a memoir about trauma that you have endured. Not that there isn't a place for writing when you're not well, because I could show you a stack of 30 journals that I went through in my childhood and adolescence and 20s. And every one of those journals helped me to um, ground myself and to understand what was going on and um, healed me in many ways. But that journal writing would have never made a good memoir. It was, I lacked the um, perspective. I lacked the clarity. And I, God knows I lacked the healing. So I wrote my book a full 50 years after the events that I began describing to you today, a full 50 years. Now, I'm not saying you have to wait 50 years. I did. Why did I wait 50 years? I, first of all, I had to heal physically. And very much I had to heal emotionally. Also, I had to heal socially because being a burned woman in this world is not easy, let me tell you. And there was another reason why I waited, and I'll get to that reason in a little bit. Because I had healed a lot and gone through a lot of therapy, 
I'll just be honest with you, a ton of therapy, which helped me to have perspective on what I went through and helped me move out of just being depressed or just being angry or just being, uh, you know, rageful, really. Um, I was able to approach the material of what I was going through with much more clarity and I think make it a much more interesting read. One of the things that, you know, I hear a lot from people who read my book is like, they really appreciate the humor in it because there is a lot of humor. You might think there wouldn't be, but there is. There's a lot of funny things that happen and, and they really appreciate the pacing and they really appreciate um, that I wasn't just sort of complaining. And all of those things I was able to do because I had years of distance from what I went through to when I was writing it. So I think I strongly recommend that, I mean, journal all you want. And by the way, some of that material might be a gold mine for you after you've healed, but don't rush into writing a memoir. Take your time to heal first and you'll do a better job at it. Another thing that I wanted to address is the importance of having a theme to your memoir that is not just telling your story. Now, I will say that when I sat down to write Flashback Girl, I didn't yet have that theme. To me, I was just like, I had to write this. I had to write this. I had to write what I went through. I had to get it out there on the page. It was a really a compulsion. But in writing it, I found a theme and the theme was something that was beyond me and something that would be helpful to other people. And I've read a lot from other memoirs on the singular importance that your memoir be something that can be helpful to other people because, you know, let's be clear, people are reading it for themselves. And they don't want to just be entertained. They want to learn something from it, get a message from it, be uplifted in some way, be inspired in some way. So my theme as I developed it was that um, life is incredibly challenging and often far more challenging than we expect or admit. But the good news is that resilient recovery is possible. I went through something, some things, so horrific you can't even imagine them. And yet here I am 50 years later, a psychologist, happy, married, with children, leaving, living a beautiful life. And my theme is basically, if I can do that, you can do that too. So that's my theme. Having a message to the memoir, I find has been incredibly useful in giving presentations afterwards. And I, I'm gonna assume that as writers, a lot of you are aware of that, you know, one of the ways that you get people interested in your book is presenting. So having a theme that is not just about you, but is applicable to other people is what's gonna get people interested in coming to your presentation and buying your book. So that theme is, huge, I think, in terms of getting people interested in what you've done. Another thing I wanted to bring up is writing about other people. I showed to you the cast of characters in my book, my mother, my father, my brother, and myself. And I told you that I waited 50 years to write my book. So the other reason why it took me 50 years to write this book is that I literally waited until every single one of those people in that picture had passed away. I had to, because they're, the honest and true story of what I went through, unfortunately did not reflect particularly well on my parents and in particular my mother. So I waited until my mother died. I didn't wish to cause her pain, I didn't wish to cause a family rift. I didn't, I, you know, I just was not wanting her to have to deal with that. So I waited until she died. And three weeks after she died, I started writing my book. Um, 
And that is, you know, generally an issue with memoirists is how you want to deal with the other people if you're writing about them. One of the um, decisions I made when I wrote was that when I was writing about people positively, I would use their accurate first name. I didn't really identify anybody by last names. Well, maybe a couple people, but very few. I would use their first name if I was writing about them positively. And if I was writing about anybody negatively, I changed their name. Still having done that, there was one person in my book who will not be named, who um, pointed out to me that he could be figured out if one really wanted to, even though I changed his name, I changed identifying stuff. He said, you could still figure me out. And he was mad at me. He was really pretty darn mad at me, actually. Um, what I learned uh, after a couple of these mad at me conversations is that really, as long as you're writing about people accurately and you're not you know, making things up about them, you can write about them and you don't even have to change their name if you don't want to, because you're not lying, but why not change their name? Um, the other thing I learned is that if you are writing about people accurately and it is something that is life destroying to them, I mean, you know, disclosing that they did a horrible crime or something like really life destroying, they might have the ability to sue you for that. Other than that, I mean, they could sue you but no one would win. Um, that's what I learned in my panic Googling when this person was mad at me. So definitely it's safer to wait until people are gone. But then I think a lot of times you are waiting a long time. Um, the other thing that came up in writing about others was um, uh, extended family members. And I was pretty worried about that at the time, how that would go, especially with my mother's family. I found that it really didn't cause problems. Um, I believe that the tone of my memoir is so vulnerable and um, I am so devastatingly truthful about myself as well that it's kind of hard to be mad at me except for that one person who I won't say who it was. But if you read the book, you'd figure it out. <laughs> uh, I guess the last issue I want to bring up before I um, pass the torch to Louise here is the psychological exposure that comes with writing memoir. So if you're gonna write a book, at least the way that I wrote a book, my book is really, as I mentioned, highly vulnerable. I, there's, there's really not much about myself that I leave unturned. And it, I'm very out there now for anyone who has read this book. And that is another reason why I strongly encourage people to have healed as best they can before they put themselves out there. Because lots of people know lots of things about me now when I have no control over what they know. And most people have been awesome and great and kind. And a couple people haven't. And that's hard. So I think, again, the tone that I set in terms of being sincerely and honestly and kindly vulnerable helps a lot. But it takes a lot of courage to put yourself out there. And um, I encourage you to be thoughtful about that. Okay, so I'm gonna stop here. I'm gonna rest and let Louise take over for now. Hey, well, thank you so much, Lise. I, I, it's just amazing, your presentation. So many things that um, are common to my journey in writing the memoir. And I just wanna say one thing, I had had a lot of therapy and a lot of something called co-counseling before I wrote. And people would always say, oh, what you wrote was healed you, right? It did, but on the other hand, it brought up a lot. So I was dealing with panic attacks as I was writing and I got tremendous help. I mean, through actually a hypnotist and a therapist and support. So I would echo you know, what you said that 
it's really important to get support as you're writing. Um, I'm going to share my screen now and think that hopefully, okay, is that, can everybody see or yes, yes, okay. Yes. Okay, good. Um, okay, so this is my book, which actually, um, this press went defunct, which was unbelievably disappointing after writing the, you know, spending so many years writing the book, but it was published by another press. So I was, I'm so happy that it's still out in the world. And what I wanted to say about that is persistence. Whatever that's, you know, if you don't, if you go away with one word, for me at least, it's just to keep persisting, keep writing, keep getting the writing better and better and better. And however you get it out, believe in your story and um, find the time to do it. Because a lot of people will say, I don't even have the time, but I used to write on napkins at coffee shops or when I was giving final exams. So um, just keep persisting. Okay, this next slide um, is my dad and me and my sister. And my sister might be here, I'm hoping. And um, I, I printed this out picture because there's total joy in my face. And this was a year before the accident that severely burned both my parents when I was four. I wasn't physically burned, but I saw my mother horribly facially burned and my dad as well. And they also disappeared from my life quite suddenly for nine months. Now writing is a way of transforming trauma and because I love language so much. And um, it's really like painting with words. So yeah, writing about trauma is difficult, but if you love to write and you love to get better as a writer, um, it's you're in a zone as you write and a place of inspiration and also a place of solace, even with all the difficulty. So writing can be both difficult and liberating. So this is a little bit about the story. My sister and I were upstairs and my parents came home and lit the pilot light on a gas heater in the cellar. And it turned out gas had been escaping for hours with no smell. And there was a flash fire. My parents were taken away were very fortunate because they were in the um, medical field to have people who took really good care of them. Um, my mother almost did not live. And we were sent to live on a farm in upstate New York with our aunt, uncle, and cousins. And probably even harder than seeing the burns, even though that was really difficult, was a separation for nine months from my parents. I spent over 10 years, and it might even be a little bit more, but what I wanna to say to all of you is I have learned so much. So when I teach memoir classes, I say, I can take about seven of those years away by helping you in how to write a book. Um, I was busy with, with teaching full-time and with my kids. Um, and I had been a poet for many years. So I could write with images, paint with words, but I had no idea how to create suspense at the end of chapter. So somebody would actually want to read on how to have character development. And yes, the people, as Lise was talking about, in your book are usually your family. Those are characters. And you have to kind of separate yourself and say, okay, who is this person? And also art, because, and Lise talked about this too, in terms of a wider world, what are you trying to say? And what have you learned on the journey? And I also want to mention a writing schedule, because you can always find a little time. If it's something that you're compelled to do and you're driven to do, you can always find the time. But how do you start? 
Okay, I started with memories and scenes. Um, and I divided the book into three parts, the accident, the farm, and then reconstruction. And it would take a long time for the final shape to happen. So that's one thing I would say, be very patient with yourself. I woke up in the middle of the night with an aha moment where I realized in the reconstruction part of the book, we were all living in our different orbits. Um, everybody reacted to this accident differently. My parents were terribly burned and my sister and I were really traumatized, but we were trying all the time to look and seem normal. And that took a lot of effort. And um, so really I would say, take classes, workshops like this and learn the craft because it took me a long time. I actually didn't take a lot of classes, but I got a lot of books like Judith Barrington's writing the memoir, which I use in my classes, which really helped. The next slide is of my mother's face um, burned. And if this is going to be hard for you to look at, you can look away. Um, my mother was actually the frontest piece of a plastic surgery book. Um, the surgeon was a friend of my father's. And so this was over, I think, three or four years of all the surgeries. And one of the reasons I, I'll move off the slide, but one of the reasons I wanted to show that slide is that my mother's face is threaded through the whole book. I was so little when she was burned that it was almost like I was part of her body. So suddenly her body changed and also her desire through many years to have her old face back was part of something that we all longed for. I could hardly look at the photo when I started writing the book. And now I have another memoir coming out at the end of this year. And I say, my mother's face was a face rearranged by fire. And that was it. You know, it was still my mother, still her voice, um, but she had these burns. This picture is on the farm at where we live. And of course it's, it's Halloween. And I, I, I showed it because I, you know, I'm looking down. I have my arm around my sister who I was very dependent on, which, you know, as a six year old, she was only six. Um, but my, my whole look has changed. Even though the farm was a, a wonderful solace and it was a respite from all that was going on in New York and the hospitals. Um, and so another thing about writing from trauma is to make sure that you go back and forth. I mean, Lise talked about the humor in her book and I loved her book and I love the humor and the fact that, you know, her spirit was really strong throughout. So in this section of the book, we were sledding down the hill, we were ice skating. We had a family, by the way, with no screens at all, no TV, no computers. So we played games and we played outside. Um, and also I would say sensory detail is so important. You wanna engage the reader, not just with what you see, but what you hear, what you feel. Um, if you're writing, for instance, about uh, a beach, Go to a beach nearby, pick up a shell, feel the shell in your hand. We have the internet so you can even see what a neighborhood looked like in the 1950s. So um, research is really, really important. Um, okay. The other thing is you can find out things like what book won the Pulitzer Prize in 1954. My dad was a big reader. So yeah, you can say it's a little embellishing it because I didn't really know, but I knew that he would have read The Old Man in the Sea. I also know that Ajax was called Bon Ami because I researched it. 
you research clothes. What do people dress like? What do they look like? How is it different? So you're creating a whole world and a world that's very different. Um, I'm going to move from this one. The book consisted of many stories that I had to merge. And I worked with three editors. And I must say that the last editor I worked with, who sadly passed away, a friend of my sister's, helped me enormously. He told me to create a timeline for each story. So for instance, my sister and I had a story on the farm. What were the important moments for each of us? My parents were in the hospital. What were the important operations or things that they went through? And I was very lucky to find a list of all the operations because there was a, there was a lawsuit and a deposition. And I had a lot of material. Another thing for research, if anybody important to your story is still alive and willing to talk, I would say, call that person up now, because when people pass away, the stories are gone. You can't really get them anymore. Um, the other thing really, okay. Um, I guess to end with, I want to talk about probably similar in some way to what Lise was talking about, but finding your truth. I really did not even realize that I had gone through anything because it was so buried inside me. I didn't have the physical scars. And so I wondered, why am I feeling the way I'm feeling? Or why am I more on high alert? Or why do I get the panic attacks? And I had to really get a lot of help and realize my truth was something I wanted to share with the world. The book started that way. You know, what about me? I went through all this, these things. What about me? And the, over the years, it became a bigger book about my parents, a much bigger hearted book. This is a picture of my family, my husband, my two daughters, our dog who passed a while ago. We have a new dog. And, um, you know, the importance of family that, you know, Lise talked about that too, that we were both able to um, create families, however you do it, or it could be a family of friends. It's just love in your life, you know, that you have people and connections. And that's me and my sister um, at a little book party that was given for me by a close friend. And uh, Dorothy Allison talks about, I want hard stories. I demand them for myself. I won't read the whole thing, but it's okay to write hard stories, but give yourself a break too. You know, write in the present sometimes and then go to the past. And if it's hard, move away from it writing the scene of the accident, I wasn't actually there, took me a long time. So be patient with yourself. I was very excited, you know, as Lise has gotten a lot of awards to get um, the mention at USA Book News, the Oprah mention. I did readings all over the country. I was a speaker at the World Burn Congress, which in some ways, was one of the most meaningful talks I gave, which is that people in a family where somebody who is burned also go through a lot of things. And, and it's important to understand that. And people have written to me from all over the country about the book and how it moved them. And that's why you write, to connect with other people. Well, I think I am going to uh, stop here and we'll open it up for questions. Great, thank you both for sharing all of this personal information, but also this, this writer's advice is um, fantastic. So I, I can tell just on the basis of the uh, comments that are so far in the chat space that you're, you're really 
uh, touching on something here. Um, so some people have made a few comments and I'd like to encourage people to go ahead and put your questions in the chat space. Um, it looks like the first comment is by Rick. Um, since we have a rather small audience right now, Rick, would you like to ask your question or make your comment directly or maybe you're not in the audience anymore? Let's see here. No, I don't see Rick. Okay, let's move on to Ken. Ken, would you like to ask your question directly? Is Ken still here? Okay, Nope, Ken's not here either. You're dropping like flies. How oh, strange. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Looks like Winna is here. Winna, would you like to speak and ask your question directly? I'm trying to turn you on. Here we go. Okay, somehow she's not unmuting herself. So I'll ask her question for her. So how did you find a publisher for your stories? Did you, uh, did you query them or did they find you or how did that work out for both of you? Um, well, I think I, we should go okay. first. <laughs> the, the what? Yeah. You should go first. Oh, okay. Well, um, yeah, I, I, that, that took me a long, long time. And I did query and I did work with, I, I forgot to mention that in the story. I worked with two agents each for a year. One gave me an in-house editor and then dropped the book. It was really devastating. Um, and then I just kept going and found, uh, I finally found an agent who spent a couple of years you know, saying, oh, she could sell the book and it's wonderful and then wasn't able to. And then suddenly on Valentine's Day, I think in 2010, um, she was emailing me. Um, I was at a writer's conference and had gone into a Kinko's. It was freezing outside. And anyway, I got the email that she had sold the book to a small press um, that, you know, so I, I got a very, I got a, I did get an advance quite small, um, but it, it was just wonderful to have the book out, but it took me a long time and a lot of agents and a lot of letters and all of that, but that's not the only way to publish a book. So um, Lise, <laughs> you take it away. So that was a good, um, good handoff there. So my, uh, my memoir came out in 2020. And I, when I was done with it, I landed my very first person I queried, signed me. That's how quickly I got an agent. I had met her at a conference, big New York agent. And I'm like, psych, I am done. <laughs> she could not sell my book proposal. My book proposal went to publisher after publisher after publisher and was eventually rejected. And I am not making this up 30 times. Mm -hmm. And the publisher said repeatedly, love the story, love the writing. We're really not doing memoirs of unknown people. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I am not famous. And at the time I had a relatively small platform that has improved a lot, but just the same. Uh, I really do think that most publishers are just not that interested in publishing memoirs unless you are famous or have a huge platform. There are some exceptions. I was not lucky enough to be one of them. So I self-published. I figured it out. I, I just, I figured it out. And it actually has turned out very well for me uh, because if you can figure it out and if you are able to put out a quality product and if you're able to speak and promote and do all the things that one does, you get a lot more of that money back. Uh, so, so, you know, it, it, it is a way to do it. I, I still sort of feel a little bad that I wasn't able to sign a traditional publisher, but I will tell you this story. Um, 
I recently was interacting online with a, a woman who is a well-known author. I don't want to say, cause I'm not sure how much she's putting it out there. She's a well-known author and she just self-published her memoir. And I wrote to her and I said, why did you choose to self-publish? She said, no publisher would take my book. She said, I've sold 8 1.8 million books and no one would publish her memoir. So it's really getting tough if you're an unknown uh, person, but, but there is a way to do it and you can figure it out. And it's actually awesome self-publishing. It's only getting harder, but I think that the rewards are getting bigger for self-published people. So uh, don't discount that, but it is, it is a lot of work. Um, okay, now we have a question from Miriam. And Miriam, would you like to ask your question directly? Sure. Um, <laughs> uh, the question has to do with um, unexpected physical illness. Um, if you're not yet healed from it, you can have learned a lot along the way, but there is no, and I lived happily ever after. I mean, you can say all the things that you have learned along the way, but my difficulty is that there's no therefore to my story. And I wonder if you have any input on that. I'll jump in on that, Miriam. Um, when I was talking about healing, so, you know, and I, and I made that point earlier, I really was talking about psychological healing. I was not talking about physical healing, although that was a part of my journey uh, too. So I think that it is good to come to some place of psychological healing before you write your memoir. But, you know, I, I also, I will never be 100% physically healed. I am scarred on 65% of my body. And and it is a uh, lifelong health condition for me. So I can relate to what you're saying. <clears throat> I don't know how to tell you what meaning there might be in your journey, but I imagine it's there. And I just encourage you to look for it. It doesn't have to be a happily ever after thing, but meaning. Those are my thoughts anyway. I hope that's helpful. Yes, thank you. Okay, uh, Nancy can does not have a microphone, so I'm going to ask her question for her. When looking for an editor for your memoir, do you have any suggestions about the types of experience that um, that might be helpful for them to have? For instance, did any of your editors have similar experiences to what you are writing about? Um, and if they did, did that help or not with getting um, your book? Uh, edited and um, packaged? Um, I can start with that. I actually, for Burned, I can't remember the name, <laughs> three or four editors. Um, it didn't, what I was really after in, in Burned was writing the best book that I could write in terms of the writing, um, engaging a reader, learning all those things that I mentioned, you know, there, there is plot in memoir, there are characters. So I, I didn't care so much whether the person had had a similar experience as me. I just really cared whether they um, could help me get the book in better and better shape. So I, all of them, uh, and by the way, I would, I really put this out that you don't have to be an English instructor or even an editor to help somebody with a book. So you can show it to friends, you can swap with um, other people because editors can be expensive. But I would say you wanna look for somebody who's sensitive, who's insightful and who really, really is helping push you to the best writing that you can do. So I'll just jump in and add a, a couple um, additional thoughts to everything. I mean, I agree with everything Louise just said, and I'll add a couple of extra thoughts. For myself, it was very important for me to hire people because I wanted them to really put a lot of time and effort into the book. I had friends read it too, 
And they were mostly like, it's great. <laughs> you know, and that was wonderful and helped me feel good, but didn't really help the book improve. So I, I set out to hire editors. I hired three of them and I concentrated on people who were like, you know, experienced writers and also people that I felt could both support me and challenge me. Mm -hmm. uh, people who knew how to start with a compliment and then say, okay, now let's look at this. <laughs> I, I didn't want just, it's all great. And I, I emotionally couldn't have tolerated it if it was like this sucks and this sucks and this sucks. I, I, I couldn't, cause it's, you know, a memoir is so personal, right? I, I, that would have been too hard for me. So for me, I had to have that balance, which I think is kind of similar to what Louise is saying as well. Yeah, I agree with that. And that's so important in terms of uh, critiquing to find the good things in it, but really you want to get better. And that's so important. And you can get better from almost any level where you are. You know, even if you're, you think, oh, the writing's really good, you can often go deeper and add more important detail. So I think having that drive to get better and better is really, is really good. And then to know when it's done also. <laughs> All right, um, Thomas has a question that kind of piggies, piggybacks on that how to go deeper um, comment that you made. Um, his daughter had has a tragic story and his question is how to balance the multiple perspectives um, in the story that one tells of the, you know, of all the characters that are in in the story that are, are part of it. How do you balance their perspectives with, um, with the way your narrative takes shape? Yeah, I, I, can, I can start with that. When my book, um, you know, left just being, well, what about me? You know, our story wasn't told. I'm talking about me here and my sister. Um, and moved into the story of my parents, I had to actually imagine, um, you know, for instance, that I was my mother when she was getting um, hand therapy, her hands were very badly burned. She had to walk through Peter Cooper Village, a housing development that we lived in in New York City. And she didn't want people to look at her face. So she would look down at the ground. And I actually went and I did that walk. And I tried to imagine it and look at the cracks in the concrete and hope that nobody else would stare. So, and then with my dad who went into a huge depression and was almost suicidal, um, I had to imagine what he was feeling and what he was reading. So um, I, was able to put in multiple points of views, but there were only four of us. I would say that could, I mean, some people could do it with a lot of people, but, but I think the story of the, you know, the main protagonist has to kind of go through the whole, really be clearly threaded through, because you don't want to lose that. You know, I've often say when I teach memoir, you know, put yourself in it more, you know, don't just write about other people. So you have to balance that. I don't know if that helps. It's a, it's a very important question and it's not easy, um, but yeah, it's, it's trying to, to get to the truth of each person. I'm just going to rest that with Louise because she teaches writing and knows so much more about this, the craft of it than I do. Yeah. Thanks, Lise. Yeah. yeah. And just general, you know, general advice is to read lots of memoirs and see how other people do it because, um, you know, really that's going to be a really great uh, teacher is to find, find someone else's memoir and <laughs> <laughs> and and admire and study how they threaded the stories through. Um, one that I really wanted to recommend is um, the story of Henrietta Locks. Um, oh. And I'll put that in the chat space um, because the author of that book has written a lot about her process for drafting that memoir and how specifically I remember how 
like literally she threaded in the multiple perspectives um, of the other characters in the story to, to form a braid as she calls it. So I'll put that in the chat space um, for you, uh, Thomas. Meanwhile, we have another comment and question from Teresa. She has PTSD from past abuse and is trying to write a memoir about overcoming that abuse. And she's looking for advice on writing, specifically if you have any step-by-step -step advice. Um, and uh, she has to stop for periods of time and in order to get through the writing, because I presume it's so painful. And so she's um, looking for any steps on how to, I guess, process the abuse that she's feeling and keep writing. Hmm. Hey, well, I, I can step in on the, the writing part. I use this book, you might or maybe put it in the chat, Writing the Memoir by Judith Barrington. And I, I find it very nuts and bolts and very helpful about the different elements. I mean, learning about sensory detail and scene and summary and also point of view, time shifts. You know, she goes through all of these elements. And I would say um, to Teresa that, you know, you could put in the writing, the difficulty about writing it. You know, in other words, that's part of what's going on. So I would say, you know, if you have to stop, you could even put at the end of a chapter or whatever, I'm stopping now, I'm starting to have these images in my head or whatever. So the, so the reader sees the process that you're going through. I, I love that. I love that idea of actually putting in the writing what you're going through. I think that's perfect. Um, and I also want to come back to the idea about the difference between journaling and writing and how the journaling might might have even eventually become what you're writing. But I, I wouldn't put pressure on yourself when you're going through all that, that it's got to, you know, come out and be some perfect book, because I just don't think that's possible. You know, I know for myself, and I was not going through PTSD when I was writing this book, although I've, I've had it. Um, in the beginning, I was just writing it out, just putting it out there. And then I would go back and shape it and craft it and shape it and craft it and edit and re-edit and re-edit. But in the beginning, I wasn't putting pressure on myself that it had to be a certain thing. And I think if you're going through anxiety, it's important to not put any more pressure on yourself. And also to know whatever, whatever it is that you know grounds you and have those things nearby you, whether it's the ability to take a walk if you're getting too upset or a friend that you can call, or, um, you know, I know when I get upset, I go and I pet my dog and I feel better. And just kind of making sure you're taking the time to ground yourself and take care of yourself. It's not a race. You don't have to race yourself through this process. You might be writing it for years, I don't know. That's okay. Those are my thoughts. Yeah, those are great. All right, we have one time for one more question. Penny asks, how did your books impact your family, your husband and children? Yeah, I, I can I can start with that. And you know, it's 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 very complicated in a way because my openness about writing the book and the fact that I had panic attacks because my children were four and six when I started writing it. And my sister and I were four and six at the time of the accident. And I had what people call an anniversary reaction um, where I just felt panicky. So I, I think, you know, there's something called vicarious trauma where trauma is passed down. And I think there was a certain amount of anxiety passed down. I'm not, not sure I would have been so open about talking about it when they were young. And yet there was something very powerful about that. And when the book came out, everybody was just so excited. And my husband drove me to all these readings in Cape Cod all over the place. So. You know, it was something we we shared, 
and and I think in the end they were proud, very proud. But um, yeah, it was difficult for my children to, writing about that material. And I'll just jump in and say that um, my 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 daughters, I think, learned a lot about me having read this book. Uh, actually, my older daughter wound up doing the audio book for the book because she's an actress. And so yeah. they, it in many ways brought us closer because they understood a little bit more, you know, what my life was like. They're young ladies. So, it, you know, they were ready for that. And I think also my husband, I think it in some ways brought us closer because it's one thing to hear the stories. It's another thing to see it all laid out, be like, oh, that's what you went through, huh? Mm -hmm. And they're proud, you know, they're proud because whoever thought I'd be doing all this at my age. So it's You're been right, exactly. actually a wonderful family thing. It's great. Thanks. Yeah. All right, great. Well, I want to thank you for all of these insights. It sounds as if you are uh, really tickling people's um, thought process as far as how to make their own writing um, deeper. Um, so thank you both for all that you've shared today. Um, and I wanna thank our audience for their insightful questions um, because I think the Q&A period of the event is often the, uh, the most interesting. Um, and I just wanna tell you that the Mechanics Institute, about a third of our members are writers. So we have a lot of programming, much of which is free um, to help people become better writers. And, and part of that's because we're a library. I mean, the last thing a library wants to do is to read bad writing, but also, <laughs> that's a joke. Um, but really, uh, as an institution, we honor the process. And um, uh, just because uh, it's, it's, it's a wonderful thing to do, even if your writing is bad, the act of writing helps helps you and helps your readers grow. So um, we have a drop-in writers group that's over Zoom. It's uh, every Thursday from 11 to one. It's called Write If You Dare. And I will include a link to that when I send out the video. Um, and then once a month, we have an event called the Writer's Lunch, which is also over Zoom. Um, and that is really a learning experience where writers from our community pop in and share, um, share their knowledge with uh, our community at large. So both of those are free. I hope to see you in those Zoom spaces. Uh, and I just hope that all of you have a nice evening. Thank you, Taryn, so much. Thank you, Lise and Luis. Thank you, it's wonderful. Have a nice evening. Yeah, you too. Bye-bye.